Um, in case you weren't here for the uh, previous session, my name is John Nystead. I am the tribal coordinator for Arizona Ecological Services. And I am your, uh, your moderator for this session. And we will uh, uh, start with the next presentation with an introduction of Jesse Miller, who is a fish and wildlife biologist for the Fish and Wildlife Services Arizona Ecological Services Office at a Flagstaff. She is the black footed ferret lead for the Arizona office, which is appropriate because she's gonna be talking about the black footed ferret non-essential experimental population area expansion in Arizona and other ferret efforts. So I will turn it over to you now, Jesse. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna put my slides, share my screen here. Um, hopefully that is working. Okay, can you see my title screen? Uh, not yet, Jesse. No. Maybe, maybe there's a little delay. Okay. Oh, there we go. I think the delay was me. So, okay. <laughs> you can see it. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, and um, yeah, it's happy. To, I'm happy to be here um, talking to everyone at this conference, and hopefully, um, I can uh, meet some of you in the future in person. Um, as John said, I'm going to be talking about the proposed uh, non-essential experimental population expansion in Arizona. And I'm trying to move my slides. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, first, I'm going to give a little bit of background about ferrets and their conservation. The black-footed ferret was listed as endangered in 1967. Ferrets were thought to have go ferrets were thought to have gone extinct until a population was found in Matitsi, Wyoming, in 1981. The ferrets in that population were captured and moved into a captive breeding program at the time, and they were then considered ferrets it was were considered extirpated from the wild in 1987. In 1991, the service and its partners began reintroducing ferrets to their native range. Ferret habitat is prairie dog colonies. They live in prairie dog burrows and they primarily feed on prairie dogs. Ferrets require large areas of prairie dog colonies for their survival. We estimate that a population of 30 breeding ferrets needs 7,415 acres of Gunnison's prairie dog or white-tailed prairie dog habitat or 4,448 acres of black-tailed prairie dog habitat. Ferrets breed when they are one year old and produce an average of 3.5 kits per litter. And when you factor in their naturally high juvenile mortality rate, their mean life expectancy is less than a year in the wild. So having this mean life expectancy that is slightly less than their age at first breeding means that it can take a while to establish a healthy population. The black-footed ferrets historical range corresponds with the ranges of the three, of three prairie dog species. The black-tailed prairie dog, which is shown, the range is shown in blue in this map. The Gunnison's prairie dog, shown in red, and the white-tailed prairie dog, shown in orange. These three species historically occupied 100 million acres from Canada to Mexico throughout plain, the plains and grasslands, and currently they occupy only 3.7 million acres. The historic decline of prairie dog habitat was due to conversion of their habitat for agriculture and poisoning of prairie dogs for perceived benefits to livestock. So this more than over 90% decline in prairie dog habitat has caused 
prairie dog or caused ferret populations to crash. And to, today, neither of these threats, um, the habitat loss and the poisoning, are, st are still considered significant threats. But the legacy of the loss of those prairie dog colonies is still having an effect. Um, and, and it's a real challenge to find contiguous prairie dog colonies large enough to support a ferret population. Plague also caused historic declines, and it's currently the biggest threat to ferret recovery today. Plague is transmitted by fleas, and it's highly lethal to both ferrets and prairie dogs. So it kills the ferrets directly, and it affects them by decimating their prey. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has uh, published a black-footed ferret recovery plan that lists criteria needed for the species to be recovered, and that means removed from the Endangered Species Act. So this is the, the goals that we're trying to achieve for black-footed ferret conservation. We need 3,000 breeding adults in the wild to meet one of those recovery criteria, and we currently have 340 breeding adults. The necessary 3,000 should be spread out across multiple populations throughout its range. And the ferrets are all concentrated in single population or there are just a few populations that are close together, they're susceptible to the same threats. So spacing multiple populations out buffers the species against the spread of plague and against the effects of other potential threats. Because of black-footed ferrets' reliance on prairie dogs, both as prey and shelter in their burrows, we can't talk about ferret conservation without also talking about prairie dog conservation. And the purpose of the Endangered Species Act is not only to recover and conserve the listed species, um, like the black-footed ferret, but also to conserve the ecosystems on which they depend. And in the case of the ferret, this ecosystem is prairie dog colonies. Prairie dogs perform unique functions on the landscape. In addition to being prey for a variety of predators, their burrow construction and grazing influences habitat diversity and species composition on the landscape. There are a number of species that prey on prairie dogs or utilize prairie dog habitat. In addition to the black-footed ferret that is an obligate on prairie dog habitat, there are other species with populations that are at least partially linked to healthy prairie dog populations. And these include burrowing owls, mountain plovers, phrygianus hawks, golden eagles, swift foxes, horned larks, deer mice, and grasshopper mice. So in addition to the number of ferrets that we have, uh, number of ferrets as a uh, recovery criteria, we also have a recovery criterion that defines an amount of suitable prairie dog habitat that's needed to meet recovery. And that's uh, 494,000 acres. And we currently have 240,000 acres. So as you can see from our recovery criteria and where we are now, we, have, we still have a lot of work to do to achieve ferret recovery. Because ferrets were extirpated in the wild, reintroductions have been and continue to be essential for establishing enough populations to meet species recovery. The Fish and Wildlife Service and our partners have reintroduced ferrets to 30 sites within the species range. Reintroduction sites have been on federal, state, private, and tribal lands. Coordination with tribes has played a big role in establishing many of these sites. Several of the reintroduction sites in Montana and South Dakota are on tribal lands, and portions of a reintroduction site in Arizona is on tribal lands. Land manager or landowner participation in reintroductions has been voluntary, and the service has utilized several regulatory tools to provide management flexibility of those reintroduced populations. So unfortunately, only half of the reintroduction sites that are shown on this map are currently active. The other half have been extirpated by plague. Emphasizing, uh, this emphasizes the importance of having multiple reintroduction sites and actively managing those sites. Well, slide doesn't seem to want to advance now. Okay, there we go. Um, plague management is crucial to ferret conservation. 
multiple, we have multiple tools that we use to control plague in prairie dog populations at, at fair re reintroduction sites and at potential reintroduction sites to prepare them for reintroduction. Delta methrin or delta dust is an insecticide that can be applied at burrow entrances to control fleas, which transmit plague. Sylvatic plague vaccine can be administered to prairie dogs through oral baits. And there have been effective trials with fipronil, which is an insecticide that can be administered or orally. And this is also put in baits for prairie dogs. Arizona currently has a ferret population that was reintroduced under a 10J experimental population rule. And this is the Aubrey Valley Experimental Population Area, or the AVIPA, and it's shown in dark gray on this map. It's composed of state, federal, and private land that's owned by the Navajo Nation and part of the Hualapai Nation or Reservation. We established the AVIPA in 1996. In 2012, the estimated number of breeding ferrets in the Avipa was 123. Since then, the number has declined to a recent estimate of nine individuals. We suspect that enzootic plague may have caused this decline, but we do not know the long-term trend or whether it is cyclical. Um, the experimental population designation under the 10J rule gives regulatory flexibility for the avipa that allows some take of the species as long as that take is unintentional and not due to negligent conduct. For example, incidental take is allowed for land use activities like ranching and it's allowed for prairie dog control activities outside of the actual reintroduction sites. Cattle ranching currently occurs in the avipa and ferret reintroduction and management has proven compatible with the ranching operations in Aubrey Valley. There are also other examples of reintroduction sites with compatible ranching activities. Using the 10J rule to reintroduce ferrets as a non-essential experimental population allows flexibility in land uses that can occur at the population in the population area while still providing a conservation benefit to the species. On June 25th of this year, the service proposed to expand the existing AVIPA to cover most of the potential suitable ferret habitat in Arizona and in the parts, parts of the Navajo Nation that overlap with New Mexico and Utah. This area would be the Southwest Experimental Population Area, or SWEPA. The proposed SWEPA consists of two separate areas that are shown in this map. The smaller part in the southeast is the historic range of the black-tailed prairie dog, which has been extirpated from Arizona. The northern part of the Sweepa is in Gunnison's prairie dog range. 49% uh, of the proposed Sweepa is on tribal lands, the Navajo Nation and the Hualapai Reservation and most of the Hopi Reservation. We reached out to 11 tribes prior to the proposal and consulted with three of them. Uh, based on our consultation with the Hopi tribe in 2017, we did not include Hopi Villages District 6 in the proposal. We could potentially include Hopi Villages 6 pending the Hopi tribe's review of the proposed rule and further consultation with them. The expansion of the SWEPA would facilitate fair reintroduction efforts in Arizona to contribute to the range-wide recovery go goals. Arizona Game and Fish Department published a fair management plan for Arizona in 2016 that outli outlined the goals for Arizona to contribute to fair recovery. Um, th so these goals are to establish three to five ferret populations in Arizona with at least 30 breeding adults per population. This map, which is from that plan um, from the Arizona Game and Fish, shows the existing ferret reintroduction sites in the proposed SWEPA. These are the ones in green that are clustered in the western part of the area shown on the map. The one furthest to the west is the Aubrey Valley and the contiguous Double O Ranch area where the existing ferret population is located. 
the SB allotment is the one just to the east and it's not currently active. It was extirpated by plague. Arizona Game and Fish has identified several other potential reintroduction sites spread across suitable habitat in the state. These are indicated in blue on this map. Uh, there's the Kaibab National Forest, Colorado Bar Ranch, Petrified Forest National Park, and Lyman Lake. And each of these sites encompasses a mix of public and private lands. The Colorado Bar and Petrified Forest sites also include Navajo tribal lands. Additional sites may also be available within the SWEPA. In 2010, the Navajo Nation and the Hopi Tribe, in collaboration with Natural Heritage New Mexico, conducted a remote survey of Gunnison's prairie dogs habitat on the lands of both of those tribes. And this survey used standard photo interpretation techniques on digital orthophoto quarter quads, and it estimated the area of active Gunnison's prairie dog towns on the Navajo Nation and reservation of the Hopi tribe at 2,500, 253,262 acres. Um, so, so there are some, there might be some other potential sites in addition to the ones that have been identified on this map. Um, adding more reintroduction sites to have multiple ferret populations across the proposed SWEPA area would help guard against plague affecting a large part of the ferret population and would buffer those sites from the spread of plague. Um, all the future reintroductions in the SWEPA are contingent upon voluntary participation by the landowner, the land manager. They are also contingent upon having prairie dog populations that can sustain a ferret population. Prior to a re reintroduction at a potential site, we would survey prairie dog populations and collect other information about the habitat there and the incidence of plague to determine the suitability of that site for a fair reintroduction. We would likely have to enhance prairie dogs and manage plague at potential sites before they are suitable for a fair reintroduction and continue to manage after a reintroduction. Expanding the 10J rule to cover the larger area of the SWEPA would facilitate ferret recovery by providing a single mechanism to allow landowners within the area encompassed by the SWEPA who want to voluntarily participate in ferret recovery on their property. The proposed rule and the draft environmental assessment were published in the Federal Register on June 25th of this year. Uh, we have notified the tribes and have offered to consult with them. We, um, in the future, we will conduct peer review and address public comments to the notification in the Federal Register um, on the proposed rule. And we will follow up with coordination with the tribes and the states as, as requested, conduct inter-service Section 7 consultation on the proposed action, and then finalize the documents. And we anticipate the rule being finalized in mid-2022 uh, when it would be ready for implementation. And now I can take any questions if there are some. See, I can't see the chat right now. Is there anything in there? Yes, yes, I can. This is John. Um, okay. Uh, question from Vicki Olmsted. Do the vaccine and or the vor uh, oral insecticide transfer from prey to predator? Um, I, not that I'm aware of, although there, um, I think there might be still some, uh, you know, the, the fipronil, is a little new in this application. So I, th I think there's still some, uh, some, some studies that are looking into that. Yes, and, and uh, Jesse, I will just add that I am not aware of any transfer of the um, inoculation, but 
could you did you talk much about fipronil? Um, I, I had to step out for a moment, so I'm sorry if I missed that. But if you could talk a little bit about fipronil, if you if you didn't earlier. Uh, yeah, I just mentioned it as one of the uh, tools that we have to manage plague, and that it's being used. It, it's been used um, fairly recently, um, and and is still a little bit, I believe, in the trial phase, um, but, but is being used out in prairie dog um, colonies and prairie dog colonies with ferret reintroductions. Um, and, and it's uh, it's a insecticide that'll control the fleas and it's administered orally and it's given to the prairie dogs in baits. Um, but as far, I've not heard about any anything of that transmitting then to the ferrets or anything, any other species that might eat the prairie dogs. And then um, Vicki follows up and she says, for these things being used in prey dogs, is it going to be used for the ferrets? And um, if, if I understand your question, Vicki, uh, the intent for um, plague management with prairie dogs is that it would then benefit ferrets uh, because prairie dogs being the prey of ferrets, um, anything that um, maintains the population of prairie dogs would, would, would benefit ferrets. You know, there, there would be no transfer of the, the immunity, but by <clears throat> inoculating prairie dogs, um, that would um, ensure a stable prey base uh, for, for black-footed ferrets. Yeah, and, and if you control the plague in the prairie dog population, it's also controlling plague in the ferret populations at that, at that site. Um, and currently the ferrets that are released into, at least released it, during a reintroduction, they are given a vaccine for plague um, before they're released. And anytime they are caught for, um, you know, surveying reasons or um, in, any other reasons they're giving, given vaccines then too. And Vicki says, thank you, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, concerns from folks listening in? Hi, John. This is Julie. There's a question on the HUVAS part, too, that oh, says, sure. um, has COVID been a factor or is it too early to tell? Um, the last I heard COVID, um, I, I think it was identified that, that domestic ferrets could get COVID. And so we assume that black-footed ferrets also can, so precautions are being taken at the um, captive breeding sites to uh, prevent spread of COVID, COVID to the ferrets there. And um, I believe they're also being vaccinated for COVID at those facilities. So there hasn't been any direct effects on ferrets, black-footed ferrets that we know of but it certainly has affected our field operations. Oh, because, yeah. Yes. Because we, we don't want to risk ferrets, you know, either uh, receiving or transmitting COVID. Um, so like in Arizona, that has really curtailed um, Arizona Game and Fish's uh, operations in doing ferret surveys in order to protect both the ferret and protect staff who work on ferrets. Yes. Very, very good question. Yeah. We've still got about five more minutes before the next presentation. Are there any other questions? I have a question. This is Julie. Um, do you have any idea how the the recent cloning of one of the black footed ferrets, how that's going to impact their recovery, overall recovery efforts? 
I, I don't know the actual plan there and I'm not involved with that, um, but it does potentially allow um, some more genetics into the population. So right now the, um, all the ferrets that are in the captive breeding uh, facilities were descended from I think seven individuals. I might be one or two off there, but I think it's seven. Um, and so all the black-footed ferrets that we have have the, are limited in their genetics by those, those seven founders. Um, and so having uh, this uh, cloned one could potentially um, introduce some more genetic diversity into the population. Um, and, and again, I don't know the plan on how to do that and, and, uh, or the details on that, but it's, it's pretty exciting. So um, Jesse, since we have a few more moments, um, what, what's what's going on currently out in Aubrey Valley? What do what are you guys what you what what's Game and Fish doing, and, and and what are you doing with them? Yeah, so we were we were talking about the fipronil before, and uh, they are doing a fipronil study in the Aubrey Valley, where they are doing um, they have some experimental plots and some control plots, and also some plots. Well, some of their experimental plots, they have they are applying fipronil to um, putting the baits out for the prairie dogs, and some of the plot uh, the experimental plots they're putting um, just the delta dust at the burrows, and they're going to be looking to see how the populations of prairie dogs in those experimental plots compared to the control plots, um, and and uh, and and this is at one of the ferret reintroduction sites. And are, are there plans to do um, ferret inventories out in Aubrey Valley? And, and do you need volunteers to help with that or, or you know, human fish? They are going to be doing some more spotlighting surveys in the fall. And I'm sure they are going, they would be happy to have um, as many volunteers as they can get to do that. Um, it, it's quite an effort uh, to do that because um, it, yeah, it involves going out all night looking for the ferrets with uh, spotlights and they are they're kind of kind of hard to to see they um yeah I was out for three nights I guess a month ago and, and saw did see a couple of ferrets at one hole um one night but they and we they never showed up again so we weren't able to actually trap them but um they're out there so yeah that should be happening in the fall some more surveys and so folks can uh, contact either you or, or folks with Game and Fish to volunteer? Yep, Game and Fish would be the one coordinating it, but um, I do have my contact information up on the slides. So if you want to contact me about that, I can um, get you to the right people at Game and Fish. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, we are at about one minute till the next presentation. So I think we will um, effect the, uh, the transition.